Uh, so good afternoon. I am joined today here by Professor Dick Mester. He is the president of the German Environment Agency. Professor Messner, as some of you may already know, he's a recognized expert internationally on globalization and global governance, transformation of countries, sustainability, decarbonization of the global economy, international cooperation and societal change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, before joining the agency last um, January, he was a vice rector of the United Nations University and also the director of its Institute uh, for Environment and Human Security in Bonn, Germany. So, uh, Professor Metzner, it's a real honor to have you with us uh, today and welcome to this session. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Great opportunity for me. <laughs> Okay, we, we, we look forward very much to hearing what you have to say. Let's start, Let's start um, to talk a little bit in general about the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations. So it's been five years since its adoption, and more and more we're hearing from scientific voices like yourself um, that there's a lot of support for the Sustainable Development Goals. There is warning about climate change, resource depletion, and increasing inequalities. Now, on the one hand, sustainability has gained some ground in public opinion, and it's moved up in some political agendas, but COVID has also had kind of negative consequences. It's pushed us back somewhat in the advances that we have made. So to start with, uh, what is your general evaluation of the situation? Do you think we are seeing a change in the world? Do we need to achieve these goals? Or what, what would be your thoughts around the whole mm -hmm. area of the agenda? Center? Okay. Maybe first to the agenda as such, and then Corona coming in. No? The, my three sentences to the, to the agenda as such would be, the 2030 agenda is about deep transformation. It's not incremental change, it's deep transformation, what is needed. No? And there is a growing consensus around it, I would say. My second sentence would be that we can do this. I would argue, and we can move into details afterwards, that the preconditions to make this happen are existing in terms of our, our technological capabilities, our institutional capabilities, the finance needed to make this happen. So preconditions are there. We can do that. We could do that. Do it. No? My third sentence would be, we have to accelerate because we are far too slow. Then Corona coming into the whole picture, changing, changing the panorama. This is something which we did not expect. This is a white a black swan. No? So an event which we did not expect. expect. And my, my ob observation then are the, are the following. In the climate area, I'm astonished that we are getting more and more ambitious climate targets, targets from around the globe in the middle of the pandemic and the crisis of the pandemic. This is interesting no? because in 2008 and 2009, the financial crisis, all our issues, sustainability, climate, ecology, SDG agenda, which was, was emerging in these days, no? has been seen as a luxury. This has been seen as something which you cannot focus on in a crisis. This seems to be different this time. No? We also, from our institution, UBA, the German Environment Agency, we did a study where we analyzed 130 reports on stimulus packages around the globe. So in Europe, in the US, in Latin America, from around the globe, China, I do not think we missed any important uh, report. And I was afraid that the same would happen then in 2008 and 9 our issues disappearing from, from the agenda. This time it is the opposite. No? You find very few reports not focusing with new business concepts on climate protection and investments in sustainable infrastructure. So the perspective of modernization and how to create the next wave of innovation and investments, this is changing. No? We need to see whether countries now really invest into this direction. But if you look into these reports, there is a new global green consensus, actually. Then we see backlashes in the social field. I mean, Corona is a multiplier of inequalities, which has been existing beforehand already, and now they are even deeper. No? So from the so social perspective, it has become, uh, we are running into a more difficult situation than we have been beforehand. You are um, painting a quite a positive picture, which is uh, refreshing. Uh, in the sense that we have opportunities. Now, you also mentioned that we've had backlashes like the social uh, impacts. Are there <clears> other areas where you would say, look, if we would have to pinpoint uh, where we should maybe put more effort, accelerate further, or what we haven't really done so well so far, what mm -hmm. would you say? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I could explain it in the field of the European Union. No? In a sense, if you look from a global perspective, I spoke about this green consent, new green consensus. It is a new green consensus globally, interestingly. No? If you look at the first pictures and data which are coming up regarding real investments, we in Europe actually are doing things not so badly currently. No? So we are investing more than other regions and countries into sustainability and climate protection, which is fine. No? But zooming into the European picture, I would argue that the first reaction to the Corona crisis was national waves. No? We, we closed borders, we looked for national and local responses, little European cooperation, I was frustrated. No? This was the first sequence. The second sequence was very important and interesting. I had a discussion with many of my colleagues heads of other European environment agencies. We discussed in May and April, of course, no, the impact of the Corona crisis on our economies, our people, and how are the reactions? Do we have a chance for a green recovery? And the picture was the more, the more dynamic economies uh, or people from more dynamic economies argued that in our countries, this moves well, actually. There's a convergence between recovery discourses and green economy and climate protection. And the weaker economies, the other side around. No? So the weaker economies are arguing that in our countries, high debt already, high unemployment already, discuss about climate protection. This is this situation very difficult. No? So this was the situation in, in April, in May. And then what we got, you will remember the 750 billion package, thanks to God, no? because this was European solidarity. Because most of this money, 750 billion euros to fight the social and economic impacts of the corona crisis are moving into the weaker countries. No? So this has been an act of European solidarity and without this European solidarity, international cooperation based, no? we would not have got, got the more ambitious climate goal which we got last week. No? I would have liked to see an even higher ambitious, uh, a higher, uh, higher ambitious goal. We argued from my agency for reducing the climate uh, greenhouse gases from 40% from to 60, even 65%. We got 50, 50, 55, as you know. But if we haven't, if we would not have seen this 750 billion package, European solidarity based, no, we would not have gotten this, this new ambition, ambitious goal. So this is uh, how I see the picture. No? Where I see huge challenges now is that we seem to forget that there is a global south. So we do not have only weaker actors in the European context, which we need to support. Globally, there are huge divergencies no? and discrepancies from an economic and social perspective. And this is different in a negative way, comparing it with 2008 and 2009. In 2008 and 9, you will remember that we had huge investments to stabilize global, global south markets. No? This time, this is not uh, happening at this scale. So in Europe, we have a nice package towards the European Green Deal. We try to synchronize green packages with recovery programs, but our, our, our perspective beyond our European horizons is too weak. You know? So I would like to see much more engagement uh, globally to synchronize recovery packages with social issues and sustainability perspectives. Yeah, th yeah, thank you for that. I mean, that, that's a big one, isn't it? Because as you, you, talking, you were talking about last week and uh, the Climate Ambition Summit, and that, that's, that was marking, in fact, the fifth anniversary of the anniversary of the adoption of the Paris Agreement. And the, the, there are a lot of indications that we are already off track to get there. <laughs> now, you were now talking about, of course, that whilst in Europe there's, there's hope, as it were, we're towards mm. the, the right direction. Uh, not necessarily in other countries. So when, when you look at the commitments as a whole that were done uh, during during the Climate Ambition Summit and, and maybe also sort of thinking about what's coming, so uh, the next talks in, in COP26, where, where do you think, I mean, you, you're talking about the Global South, but w w where do you think are the solutions? Because of course mm. Europe is in a different situation and we have this, this great mm. package, but um, what are the next steps so that everyone yeah. can go towards uh, those yeah. targets that we need to achieve? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I see a tipping point situation, which I will deep, go deeper in for a second. You know, a tipping point situation in our societies. 
and then a new divergency in the global economy. No? So the tipping point of in, in which I see our, our, our countries is that, I mean, the time pressure is huge no? regarding climate. We need to have global emissions any, by, by during any decade towards uh, mid, uh, mid of the 21st century, towards 2050. Halving, no? every decade, this is huge. Acceleration is needed. On the one hand side. On the other hand side now, I see much more ambition in the discourses and in which, in which what, we, what we listened to during the, the, the climate summit now uh, a few days ago. No? So many countries committing for the first time towards a zero emission economy. No? We haven't heard many of these voices five years ago in, in Paris. No, we had the two degrees target. We had the, this corridor between 1.5 to 2 degrees. In Paris, we talked about, or people talked about, decarbonized vaguely about decarbonization during the 21st century. But now many more countries are talking about uh, zero emissions, 2050, or even before. This is a huge change. No? We have the commitment in the European Union. We have a commitment from the new uh, US government, which is very important because this is a globally very relevant actor. We have for the first time listened to China about emissions speaking and zero emissions in 2016. We know that this is too late, so we need to work on that. But we have a zero emission perspective. No? And this is new. So I, this is, I see there's a tipping point here between ambitions are raising, the time pressure is high. We don't know exactly whether these kind of, of ambitions are now really implemented, no? tipping point situation. And then the new divergency is that we have this interesting dynamics in many OECD countries, in most OECD countries now actually, and in the three large parts of the global economy, I talk about a new geoeconomical constellation towards sustainability transformations. So the US, China, and Europe moving into this direction would make a difference. No? But we see a disconnect from the developments in the, in, the, in the global south. We see the new inequalities there. We see less engagements of G20 countries, OECD countries, in cooperation with the global south. This is the new divergence. No? And the 2030 agenda was about equal development globally. No? And this is not exactly what we are moving towards. So where do you see opportunities for change? I mean, how do we actually then reach out to the global south? Is it possible? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, we need to talk to the G20 actors because 80% of emissions are being done by us. 80% of resource consumption, it's us. No, 80% of uh, negative impacts on ecosystems is also us, so it's in our hands. No? And many governments now accept, accept this kind of responsibility. And we need to convince them that if we don't reach out to the global south and make them partners in the process of sustainability transformations, we will not achieve what we are committed to. No? Because 80% is 80%, but the other 20% need to be into, it needs to be taken into consideration also. So even if you would move all in the OECD world, the G20 world towards zero emission economies by 2050, if we don't get the other partners on board, we will lose the battle no? from a climate perspective. And from a social perspective, most of the work regarding bringing the inequality trends down and bringing poverty down needs to be managed, of course, in the global south. And from a stability perspective, we as richer nations have an interest in that. No? And uh, this is the link which we need to focus on. So if we have now the chance to rethink the transatlantic relationships, no? we should not only talk about climate, ecosystems, and sustainability infrastructures. We also should talk about the inequality issues, poverty issues, and how to get the global south on board. I think 10 years before, we had a stronger perspective on global south relationships. No? And we have been less ambitious in 10 years ago from a climate perspective. Now it's the other way around. No? Now we move into the climate direction, forgetting the global south. No? But in the 2030 agenda, we already committed that we have to bring these two dimensions together anyway. When one of the things you were talking about, the European Commission and sort of the, the, the new European Green Deal. I mean, what we're seeing in the movements uh, now with uh, President Bob von der Leyen is, is sort of the, the 
the, the impact of what they say in both digitalization and sustainability and we brought together into one main sort of package and, and, and path forward to ignite these transformations in this decade. So let's talk a little bit, let's go a little bit deep dive into these and, and whether the whole digitalization can also help with this global south situation. And then at the same time, can you also reflect a little bit about what, what do you really see if you look at Europe? Uh, what is the impact of this European Green Deal and how do you envisage the discussions of the European mm. climate law and the objectives for 2050? Okay. Reflection on the goal. Mm. Two complex questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> so the digitalization, artificial intelligence, machine learning, digital twins, you know, this whole package. I mean, looking back, it is astonishing that we, we haven't seen this in 2015, no? So when we decided uh, upon the SDGs and the Paris, uh, Paris Agreement, no discussion about digitalization, and this deep technological shift is, no, shifts. No? So uh, we have not been experts on that. And on the other hand side, the digital experts have not been experts on our issues. No? Um, I was one of the lead, ex uh, lead authors of a report about this. I have been chairing the German Advisory Council on Global Change for eight, nine years. No? And our, the last report which, uh, which I have been responsible for was on digitalization and sustainability and how to bring these two mega trends together. No? And in a nutshell, what we saw is that our assessment is demonstrating that these technologies uh, could help us to move much more rapidly forward to implement the SDGs. So the potential is huge. No? But what we also saw is that we already have these digitalization trends which are now accelerating. We have these trends for 20 years already. No? And we have not seen a decoupling of wealth creation and resource consumption, of wealth creation and greenhouse gas emissions. No? So if you don't build the missing links between the digital transformation and the sustainability transformation, we will not get things right. No? You can run with these technologies even more rapidly into the wrong direction. No? Of course, these are tools to make things even more efficient, no? to accelerate processes, to autom automatize uh, things. But if you don't build the links to drive this into sustainability directions, you drive even faster into the wrong direction. No? So building the missing links, this is the huge issue there. And then, of course, we have to recognize that these technologies could also be used in very bad senses, you know, because if you bring voice recognition, you know, pattern recognition, uh, you can trace people everywhere, every, everywhere every, in every second. You know? If you bring this together with authoritarian regimes, uh, democracy and freedom are under stress, obviously. You know? So we need, to, we need to understand how to use these technologies wisely but the potentials are huge. This is my main message here. No? Therefore, in our agency here, in the German Environment Agency, we are in 21 investing a lot of money into building up a lab for artificial intelligence solutions towards sustainability. No? So how to link this? Because what we also saw in this study, which I talked about, is that our research community and the digital research community are not cooperating still. There are very few overlaps. No? If we don't work together, we will not find the right solutions. No? So we will bring these experts together under our roof here and try to move forward. So this is uh, one story about digital and sustainability. The other story, Eva, is actually re-emphasizing what we talked beforehand, Global South and the more dynamic economies. No? I mean, these investments into digitalization and artificial intelligence are mainly taking place in China, Europe, and the US again. No? So the digital divide. And therefore, again, investing in cooperating with the global South countries also in this technological dimension is very, very important. No? So this is about your first big question. <laughs> Uh, digitalization and sustainability. And then you asked about the European Green Deal, how important it is. Mainly very briefly, and then if you would like to deep, dive deeper in certain aspects, what is really important are two very important things. I mean, this is the first commission which takes sustainability really urgently, um, urgently as an issue, no? because with the Juncker 
Commission, it was very difficult to talk about this kind of things. No? 2030 agenda, this was about development cooperation. No? Climate change, this was about environment. No? But now uh, the whole commission takes the European Green Deal as the main objective seriously. This is great. No? And then secondly, which is even much better than in the German context, no? and I'm criticizing my own government now, and because we always have been arguing in Germany, we have a sustainability strategy of the, of the German government, no? but we also have a growth strategy, an employment strategy, a competitiveness strategy. No? So the, the, our sustainability strategy is one of many other strategies. It is not, a, it is not the centerpiece. No? And our argument was always, growth, employment, technology, we need to bring all of that together with the sustainability projects. No? And this is what the European Commission has done now. So uh, good luck, I hope we can implement. No? <laughs> How much is this going to then become, you think, a trend in countries and, and be much more um, made, made into law, really? Because one mm. thing is a trend, one thing is talking about um, the importance of these things. Another one is what you were talking about. I mean, one of the big problems of the SDGs and the 2030 agenda is the verticalization. And you were just talking mm -hmm. about it again, right? The, 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 we're talking about all these problems. We, we're almost treating them independently of each other. Uh, can the commission with this new direction that it's pushing towards um, make mm -hmm. things a bit more, you know, uh, part of how countries operate? I mean, what makes me optimistic, Eva, is that heuristics, we all work with heuristics, no? So in which directions are we moving? What, 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 what are our strategic orientations, no? Because our world is complex. You cannot decide every day upon new directions. We all work with main heuristics, no? So for Europe, the European project was after Second World War, no? This was a major heuristic. This was a major part of our mental map, no? so, so working towards Europe and checking out everything what we have been doing, is this compatible with our European projects? No? In most European countries after Second World War, again, no? uh, social security nets, what we call the welfare state, this also was a major shift in perspective from a market economy without objectives no? to, a, to a market economy working towards a welfare state and the welfare of people. No? So major shifts in perspective. And this has been changing our societies, right? And I think that after 40 years or even 50 years of discussing sustainability issues, green issues, the earth system problems, etc., uh, this we, we have a shift in perspective now. We talked about it for half a century, you know, and we tried to add to our economy and to the idea of the welfare state, we tried to add here and there green aspects. You know? But now we put the whole thing at the center of the project of our societies. And this is a change. You know? What we need to focus on now is structural reforms of our policies to make this really happen. Because what we are saying is that beforehand we looked at the mobility system, at the land, agricultural system, at the economy, and we said here and there are some ecological standards. No? What we are arguing for now is we need a sustainable mobility system, a sustainable agriculture, a sustainable circular economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore the structural political, political reforms needed to make this happen, this is the huge challenge we are confronted with now. No? So uh, across Europe, and, and, and maybe you can, you can, if we go back down to Germany, maybe um, uh, as president of the German Environment Institute, uh, a, a lot of the changes in policy will also, will, will be top down, but also very much bottom up. That's what we've seen in the past. So how, how is the citizens response in your country to all of these problems? And if we link it a little bit with the COVID uh, issue and sort of that going back to local as we were talking about, uh, are citizens putting pressure? Do you think that with the current situation and the economy and the need for for sort of solving other problems that are more pressing, mm -hmm. is this going to push us back or is it going to help us to make that leap towards a stronger regulation, as you were just saying? If I would talk about the German context, my observation is that we are giving, we are having a lot of support to move into this direction now after all these decades of debates. No? 
the, the larger part of the society is arguing into this direction, regardless the, the color of the parties. No? As in all European countries, we have 15 to 25 percent going nationalistic, uh, skeptics regarding climate, skeptics regarding science, no? skeptics regarding international cooperation. But the other 75 percent are moving into this direction of a new consensus now. So we are having social democratic debates of how to manage the green transition. We are having green debates with our green party no, about managing, managing these uh, sustainability transformations, conservative discussions about that. But the main orientation is moving into this convergence towards sustainability transformations, which is very important. This is what I observe. No? When I listen to the, the private sector people, it's actually very similar. No? We also analyzed the, the debate during the Corona crisis in our, our business press, no? so private sector oriented. And the, uh, the observations there are also in contrast to 2008 and 9 financial crisis, this time also the private sector links it, its business concepts and the future business models with getting the prices right towards climate protection and innovations towards resource efficiency issues. No? So this is the main perspective which I see. Then you look at the young people. Fridays for Future. I, we have been waiting for that for 25 years. Now they are here, no? and I'm happy to see that. So uh, people can change things and perspectives. And this has impressed many politicians and decision makers. No? So when decision makers are having their dinners at home, you, myself, private sector people, our generation, no? we have our kids at uh, the table, uh, and they are arguing into this direction. And I think this helps. That's a, that's a very good positive note. Maybe to finish then on this positive note that we are coming to the end of our time, what, as, as we, we're having all the citizens now listening to us, whatever background uh, or, or um, profession, what would you say to citizens to help really move uh, this into the direction of the areas that you've talked about, as, as mm. Global South mm. Innovation and, and the movement towards this? What would be your you know, two or three action points that mm. every person can do to add and help uh, on, yeah. on towards the agenda? Okay. I would say three things, Eva. <laughs> the first one is... Uh, we can vote, no? at least in democracies, we can vote. And in the US, we saw that we can make a difference then. So voting for parties moving into this direction is into our hands as citizens. No? This is number one. Then number two is the young people are showing us that if we organize us politically, we can make a difference. No? So organizing majorities for deep transformation is necessary. We cannot drive sustainability transformations against majorities in our countries. No? So organizing ourselves politically as our young generation is demonstrating to us can make the transformation successful. No? And the third element is then, I agree when many of my colleagues are arguing that at the end we need to change systems. So mobility systems, the energy systems, we as citizens cannot change systems. This is about political decisions, this is about our government, it's about, it's about private sector, this is correct, no? But we, again, then, as citizens and individuals can make a difference in terms of our consumption patterns, no? So mobility is a very important point when it comes to climate protection. And we can drive small cars, incredible huge cars, we can use uh, public transport, our mobility patterns can look like very differently. We have in our hands our own um, climate uh, footprint, obviously. No? And this is an important aspect when it comes to mobility. Our food, food patterns are also relevant from a climate and environmental perspective. No? We all know that an important part and contribution of the agricultural sector towards climate protection is our food, con food consumption pattern and, and whether or not we consume or how much we consume meat. No? If we would reduce our meat consumption in Europe by 50%, which would be very good for our health, this is what the World Health Organization is telling us, no? this would be very good for our climate also. So again, it's us, no? our food, uh, food waste. 30% of what we can do good towards climate protection in the agricultural sector is reducing food pattern. In our rich countries, most of the food waste is, pro is being produced by citizens, by us. 
No, the government cannot help us. We buy this stuff, we put it into our refrigerators, and then we we waste it. No? So this is also something which we can do. And this is my third argument. We as consumers and citizens do have responsibilities, and we can uh, we can do better. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this is very inspiring, and it certainly sets us all home now to to be much more responsible in what we are doing. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Messner, for your time and for your very wise uh, comments and, and reflections. Uh, and we will take this forward as um, as uh, as we move into the next uh, uh, the next year, hopefully a much better year. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs>